beautiful Los Angeles theater. Thank you to Mr. Delajani for hosting us here. Uh, my name is Boris Mazels. I'm the, the chair of the historic downtown bid, and uh, I'd like to like welcome everyone. We usually don't have such a big crowd, so it's great to see so many stakeholders here. And I'd also just take like to take this opportunity to thank Blair and Paula and the Green and Clean and Safe team that have been working so hard all last year to you know deal with some of the the challenges we have in this area. But despite those challenges, I think we've excelled and been able to thrive. And uh, so welcome. And uh, I think we can start the meeting. Uh, Boris Mayzels Hoss Building. Kevin Lim with Madonna Arthur took up. And the next table. Peter. Peter. Bartolo, Kate Bartolo and Associates. Hello all. Um, I am asking for your help in both sending letters and also in-person support for the 601 Main Project. It's the Berry Shine Project and right now it is a 230 uh, space parking lot. It's being converted. It's been in Let's just say prolonged review. Here's the bottom line. It is providing 314 additional parking spaces, which is largely replacement parking, and the Planning Commission appears opposed to this. So we need to really make the arguments as to why it matters, because that additional parking is going to serve Barry's other buildings as adaptive reuse buildings in the area. And educating the commissioners, because their goal is a carless downtown, is really critical. So what I'm hoping out of this is some of you will raise your hands and I can contact you separately and follow up with you. So anyone who may be willing to help you to sign a letter of support or be in person testify, which would be hugely appreciated, if you could raise your hands, I'll know most of you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kendrick, Rustin. Good afternoon, Kendrick Rustin, uh, with KR Interior Design Group, as well as I'm the Secretary of Saving All Kids Organization. And I'm just asking for the endorsement of the Historic Core Business Improvement District for Redo Downtown LA 2018 Historic Core. It's curb appeal and architecture, involves speakers, and then design your ideal building uh, to live in in downtown LA. It will be an audience participation workshop, um, and um, <clears throat> it will be uh, basically involved very realistic in terms of the city hall regulations and all that kind of thing. So not just your ideal building, but one that could actually be built or be made here in downtown LA. And it will also involve the AIA of LA and a children's educational gar garden installation. So, and that will be at the Exchange LA here, uh, August 3rd, 2018. Thank you. 
And the last card would be for Jake McMains with LAPD.
and I appreciate that the board has been willing to think outside the box to order, you know, to, to um, add an outreach perspective to what we do um, because we realize that uh, law enforcement is not the way to solve um, solve this crisis. We really have to um, employ all of our connections and relationships and get everyone involved to come up with as many creative solutions, um, including permanent supportive housing and um, resources, mental health resources. So um, I, I just, I really have to thank the, the board members, the alternates that come and participate every month. Um, take time out of their very busy schedules. These are pioneers of development and residential. These are, are people that are building a city where it was, after 5 p.m., was pretty, pretty quiet. Um, it's, uh, we're on a, a really fast track. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, but I've been really proud to lead this organization and see it emerge as um, a really strong bid. And I'm looking forward to the future. We're in renewal. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, a, a, the next term and seeing, you know, what more challenges we can overcome together. Um, I just, I want to thank all of you. We, we're, we have some plaques we're going to uh, submit to you later in the program, but um, I just wanted to take the moment to thank you guys. Um, we have the council member, Jose Wezar, here to, to speak um, for us today, and I just want to thank him as a community partner because all the initiatives that he's um, put forth for Broadway, um, the sidewalk dining ordinance, um, he's been a, a constant uh, partner in what we do and uh, building this, this neighborhood. Uh, and, I, and I can't tell you how wonderful it's been to, to enjoy your partnership. And I look forward to the next few years together. Um, so please. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, congratulations on 20 years, and uh, congratulations on another annual meeting, and first and foremost, I want to thank Blair for her courageous leadership uh, when she goes to City Hall and advocates on behalf of the bid, on behalf of this area. Uh, she's well informed and uh, actually teaches us a few things about uh, what is really going on, so, and now just as I was listening to Blair speak, reminded me of about the time when she brought forward a plan on how the city should um, address homelessness. And at the time, uh, we had this sporadic way of addressing homelessness, which was we responded to the latest uh, litigation uh, or a small program here, a small program there. But I think the information that Blair and others from downtown brought to us, that led us, gave me the idea of adopting a strategic uh, plan for homelessness for the city, which we adopted. Uh, in our homelessness committee, the first homeless permanent committee in the city council. Uh, and it was created after I went to West and I said we needed a, a permanent committee that thinks about homelessness each and every day. So it's not just this random thing that we uh, deal with. So thank you, Blair, for your uh, credible leadership. And uh, let me tell you that uh, 20 years, uh, it's easy for a lot of organizations to, uh, to, to go off and for different reasons not exist beyond a few years, but uh, this bid has stood uh, the weather of time. And not only that, but if you look back 20 years, you think about what the area was like. And yes, we have our challenges today, uh, but if you think back and you look back 20 years, um, you know, now we have a lot more activity, uh, a lot more businesses, a lot more people strolling the streets, a lot of uh, the historic uh, buildings uh, are now being repurposed and being put back to use. And, a lot of that is thanks to you and the bid and the work you've been doing. Uh, the city can't do it alone. Uh, we actually do not have the resources uh, to provide additional personnel down here. We don't have the resources to pick up the additional trash that's left out, out there. And all the work you do, not only for policy making, but the actual work has been so important in the uh, renaissance of this area. So thank you so much. Uh, and <clears throat> I, I've had a great partnership as we move the sidewalk dining that we did came from some businesses here that wanted to open up and open up in the sidewalk to get more pedestrian activity. And I looked at it and realized it took somebody like two years to get that permit and cost, it, cost thousands of dollars. So we went to them and said, hey, look, you don't have to keep sending the inspectors and charging the businesses hundreds of, thousands, hundreds of dollars. You can just go on Google Earth and see what's there and save some time. And we also, we shortened that to about 
less than six months and a lot less now. That's one example. And then the Head Start signals that when we had a number of people here being ticketed for going out and putting a foot on the sidewalk uh, and a number of the pedestrians and residents who lived here, we worked together with a bid to come up with state legislation to make that happen. And now uh, we're on the midst of kicking off Main and Spring Forward, which will provide additional uh, pedestrian bike safety on Spring Street that will make it multimodal and safe for everyone, whether you're a car, bike, or people walking. So the partners we have formed have been very good. So thank you so much for all the work you've done. And last but not least, and returning back to one of the most critical issues I think that faces all of us here, because no matter, as much as we're moving forward, uh, one of the issues that we must address and get a better handle on none of this, all of this would be for naught, is the issue of homelessness. And as many of you know, and I start off by saying that we finally have a comprehensive strategic plan for homelessness. We're implementing that now. The first step was to provide more permanent supportive housing on a decentralized level so that we no longer concentrated in Skid Row and other areas that have historically received permanent supportive housing. Where we also took the second step, which is we looked at public properties to see where we could place permanent supportive <coughs> housing throughout the city. And now we're doing more crisis housing, which is, uh, as you see what we did in El Pueblo, working with the mayor's office, we set up some uh, trailers that will take in 60 to 70 individuals in that area for about uh, six months uh, and give them services and put them on a path to get uh, bridge housing and eventually to permanent supportive housing. I'm hoping we can move some of that more over here. Uh, we're working at it, it's quite expensive. We're looking to cut down the cost, but we wanna move that out here. But I think we're also moving in a very significant step, which is today the council introduced a motion to support what Mark Lady Thomas and Catherine Berger and the supervisors are doing in the county, and that is to change the definition of a gravely disabled person when they are facing mental health issues. And as many of you know, about a third of the our homeless population have mental health issues, and one of the biggest challenges we have is how do we address that population when even if there are harm to themselves and others, I mean, you have to be at the extreme before our first responder is the LAPD. It shouldn't be LAPD, it should be people offering social services to them, but that is what we have right now. They may change, we change the language at the state level that allows us to give those people care uh, if they refuse medical treatment and the people there see that they need medical treatment for their conditions. That's gonna change the situation quite a bit because it would help get people that the services they need, and we will see a lot less people exhibiting erratic behavior in our streets here in, in downtown LA. So hopefully you'll, we'll partner again and work with the county and the city to make sure that language is changed at the state level. It may sound easy to us because we see the effects here. We're probably, of all the state, the ones that gets the biggest impact and will benefit most by the change of that language but it's gonna be a challenge and a fight up in Sacramento, so please, uh, if we could partner, we will continue to partner then. That's something that Blair brought up, brought up in one of her initial reports years ago in the homeless report she gave to us. So thank you so much, congratulations. We're here to serve, and I'm here with uh, my downtown district director, Joella Hopkins, where are you? And so everybody can know who she is. Also, Lily Gross, my uh, downtown field representative, and my wife, Rochelle Weezer, came with me today. She wanted to uh, get to know folks and, and, and see what's going on and uh, continue to do the work we, that we do here. So thank you so much. I don't know if uh, I have a resolution for you, Blair, but I can take questions if people want to ask questions. Or come. Okay. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. I would leave that. We, there's a lot of uh, procedures in place that actually have court decisions and other legal issues and how that is handled. Um, I don't know yet. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that just changing the language in wherever somebody comes in contact with these individuals is going to make a huge difference. We're just laying that out now. We're going to hear that in our homeless committee to see exactly how this law works right now and if we change the language, how that procedure will take place. So I. I, I wouldn't want to say yes or no to your question without knowing the full answer, but in 
the future, what are my reps could come after we have the hearings and we get the legal advice from our attorneys and, 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 and our departments and we know what that's going to mean. We should be changing those procedures and have a presentation here so we can be clear on that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is the increase in the police force in this permanent or is this temporary? Um, it is, I would think that given the number of the increase of crime in this area, and we use Comstat that is, uh, the, the, the whole premise behind that is to put our resources where there's higher crime, crime occurring. So uh, it's permanent to the extent that the next crime stats come up, but for right now, I would say, given from what I've seen in the past, it's gonna be here until the next crime stats come out and see what the situation is. It's fluid, crime rights in one place, more recent are put there. And that's why, as our officer said, uh, and we would encourage people to report any crime. A lot of times crimes go unreported, they don't go in the system, and so we don't get the resources we need. Um, and so we would uh, like to, uh, 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 yes, so they're permanent from now until the next crime stats come up. Are we looking to increase the size of the police force? Right now, I believe it's 95 There's, uh, I haven't seen any proposals lately. Um, I've been a proponent of uh, every budget. Um, Deliberations. The mayor's budget is being composed right now, so uh, I don't, I haven't seen any proposals recently. Um, I certainly would like to see us hire more officers as well and have them in the streets. There's a new way of policing, and particularly in a large urban area like downtown. I mean, we have certain procedures and processes of how we police a large city, but we've been a city uh, of suburbs, and now as we're getting more residents in the urban area like downtown. We're, out, we're also asking for us, uh, we're asking the department to do police differently, more walks, horses, bicycles, you know, things like that. That's what we need in this area. So I think our approach has to change as to how we police downtown. The old model of the suburban model is people trying to put in downtown, and we have to change that. Those are some talks I've had with Captain Rada, and Captain Rada is very open to that, um, and he's, he's, uh, he understands that. And we're all transitioning into that as well, so um, I, I support that. And we to see more of it. Yes, Mr. In, in the year and a half that I've lived here, I, I moved here to the historic core uh, <clears throat> because I love the buildings. It's amazing. Um, and of course, the crime and homeless went up. And I've tried to attract my friends in San Francisco and businesses here, but of course, the streets. Um, and it's been very difficult for me to get people to work with me because I don't have money right now. I have contacts with money, but everyone seems to chase money in LA. And um, they design all the, these big developments go up and they have these fake businesses proposed. You know, the, the drawings, the renderings they do are with fake businesses. And then the businesses are set up in ways that they don't fit my friend's businesses that have need certain square footage for the, the restaurant and bathrooms and plumbing. It's all very complicated, dealing with Lambert at City Hall, historic buildings. So there's this really, there's this miscommunication with LA, and then LA has kind of a, a bad reputation. <laughs> and so That's I'm just wondering, but is, is there anything besides talk going on to kind of change, to change this? Because I, I'm having a very difficult time, and that's my motivation for the event I'm doing and focusing on kids and trying to really help. Because there's, to, anyway. That to, change, I, to change what exactly? To change basically, the, the focus of LA not being so much on money as being on social health and well being and really changing. Because there's going to be more and more homeless because they've. You're helping the homeless once they become homeless, but what about why are there more and more homeless? Oh yeah. yeah. I, I guess it's kind of a overall. Yeah. Any talking more about infrastructure in our country? Talking what what's being done to uh, so, change well, that? This, 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 to answer that, it could take an hour, but let me okay. put it this way. Um, I, I, you know, there's LA is becoming known as a city, one of the largest cities in America with the largest disparity happening, right? And the homeless increase that we see in LA is not unique to Los Angeles, it's national. You see homelessness increasing everywhere. You see inequality increasing in most large cities. 
But the question, the way I see it is, how does that city and county in this respect, because they provide health and human services, we provide safe streets and home, housing. I, I'm not so, I'm sorry, not, not so much the homeless. I'm talking about new developments where the render, it's the, in order to build these building or restore the, the historic buildings, they have to design fake businesses to get it passed through City Hall. So the floor plans and all that, they're fake. It's all the, you see these new developments go up and the businesses are empty, like Genesis, the, these permanent supportive housing. The, res, the businesses are empty, they're all set. So, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I would say that there's plenty of available space in downtown, whether it's the historic core, whether it's new developments. Uh, we here on Broadway, for example, adopted our adaptive freeze ordinance for commercial buildings, which makes it easier and cheaper for building owners on Broadway to reuse the million square feet of available space in the upper floors. And so that gave a building owner some flexibility to not have to uh, abide by the strict uh, historical codes. Uh, and we're hoping that that allows people who are looking for creative space or whatever it be to adapt these buildings to that. Now the new developments, that's really a place of the private market understanding what the demand is, uh, that's beyond the government scope, right? When new developments come up, we suggest things. Our office, the planning department, different people suggest what we think may work. And we've done that quite a bit. We say, well, instead of doing creative office there, why don't you do retail because there's more need for retail there, or in retail instead of retail. That we suggest those things, but that's a private marker market dynamic that, you know, we do what we can to suggest things to people. At the end of the day, if somebody builds something new and they can't lease it out, if that's something beyond us. We could help them and let people know and make connections, but I wouldn't know how to correct that in the private For market. Me, so. I would like to say something about that in a very small scale. But just the supportive housing places, those are businesses that were created with money from <coughs> the city. I understand that other business owners that invest their own money have the right to do whatever they want with it. It's their space. Yeah. Uh, but it would be nice to see the city get involved in filling up or encouraging that since the, they came to the city for money to build right. these places because uh, you have the Rosalind that's empty in the bottom. Yeah. You know, you have, uh, you know, like he mentioned the new Genesis. But yeah. those, those maybe we can do something on a bigger scale, but maybe just here and there. Yeah. Do a little something. So, when we do policies like that, so for example, here on Broadway with our Bringing Back Broadway initiative, both for the, our sign ordinance and our lighting ordinance that we gave out grants to light up the buildings, which mm -hmm. a lot of these buildings have now been lit up and uh, looks a lot more beautiful in my view. Okay. But we say you have to be fully occupied in, uh, to take advantage of some of these policies, right? So we, we encourage through the policies, at least what we've been able to do here, to do something. But you're right, I mean, the government could intervene. Just, just with the ones that um, the government helped create. Yeah. The ones yeah. that, you know, if it's someone's private uh, development, they should be entitled to do whatever they want. Yeah. But, okay. you know. One more question over here. Um, it's incredible to see everyone out for Night on Broadway, people who haven't been to downtown before, um, and businesses with lines around the block to get in, theaters being reactivated. How are you tracking that progress and how much money comes into the neighborhood for an event like that? And, and how are we able to continue to do more events like that for the neighborhood that benefits businesses here? Great, thank you. Um, well, you know, we just finished our 10-year anniversary of our Bringing Back Broadway initiative. When we started Bringing Back Broadway 10 years ago, we gave ourselves a 10-year limit, and we set milestones and benchmarks of what we we're going to achieve. And we think we achieved everything we wanted to do, both for the policy and program. The program includes a streetscape plan that we saw here. We did the ball arts, et cetera, but at least we have data on streets are we going to extend so and the streetcar is coming later than we anticipated all the money is there for the streetcar we just have to pull down the money from metro because metro is not going to give us our 200 million dollars until the year 2050 so if we pull it down at least until 10 years from now uh, there's private entities are willing to put up the money now we're going to do a public private partnership with the streetcar so i think we met every benchmark except the streetcar uh, that's coming a little later uh, on our bringing back broadway initiative and the reason we started Night on Broadway four years ago was to bring people to rediscover the theaters, rediscover Broadway, and it's been a tremendous success. Uh, the first year we had about 5,000 people, the second year 35,000 people, the third year 
65,000 people, and, and now uh, the numbers we got is that there were 250,000 people who came tonight on Broadway this Saturday. Uh, and throughout the event, throughout the event, at one time, at the peak, you had between 120, 240,000 people on Broadway, rediscovering businesses, uh, theaters, etc. Um, and so, Night on Broadway, we think, has also achieved what our intent was for people to rediscover the beautiful theaters. Hopefully, we get more programming here, and, and they, they see businesses, they come back and visit the businesses another time. Um, and here's where we are. We, we, uh, we tracked Bringing Back Broadway. We hired, what's the name that uh, firm? Oh, Beacon Economics. We hired a firm called Beacon Economics that studied the Bringing Back Broadway initiative for 10 years. We have a report. If anybody wants to see the report, uh, contact Joanna. And it showed us that with the Bringing Back Broadway initiative, we had a, a billion dollars, additional billion dollars invested on, on, on Broadway. It shows how much more jobs were created, how many more people. So we've tracked that, and we've said, even looking at quantitative data, aside from achieving our goals that we set up, <coughs> it's been a success from an economic point of view, right? Because it was government coming in saying, let's spur this a little bit more. And that's why we started bringing back Broadway, because we saw revitalization happening throughout downtown, and Broadway was a little, just need a little more, you know. And so government coming in, spurring it a little bit, and we got that. So we got the, the economics for bringing back Broadway. For Night on Broadway, we track it. We hire a firm that gives us demographics, money spent. You know, I don't know how they do this. They take samples and they, they extrapolate from that. Um, and so, uh, and we, we also look at um, Night on Broadway and, and what it means economically, what it means demographically. The demographics, we use it, and this is very important here, to try to get sponsorship for the following year. Because when we first started out on Broadway, I didn't want it to be a commercialized event. I didn't want all this, nothing against Coke, but these Coke signs or you know whatever signs all over the place. We use Cliff bars for the silent disco because we, we it was getting expensive and we really wanted it, so we just got a sponsor for that to pay for silent disco. Um, but I think right now we have put more public money in it than I would have liked. I want to put more, have more private money come in to sustain this for the long term. So we're going to get back those reports fairly soon. Uh, we're going to get back some final uh, data, and, and in about a month, we're going to have discussions as to whether we could or could not have Anna Broadway next year. That's the reality. Um, and so we may have to go more towards, quote unquote, commercializing the event, but hopefully having it more uh, sustained by the private sector more than the public sector. So that's where we are with that. But we do collect data. And I thought it was amazing. And somebody told me there's more people here than Coachella, right? <laughs> and event. and uh, our team did a fabulous job. We, we work year-round. Um, the discussion is going to occur in about a month. Can we, can we not have it in a year? Secondly, um, is it the right place to be in my office? Can we have a nonprofit, for example, to operate it if it goes on? Because political office, we, it's not our job to put on huge events like this. We could do it once in a while, right? But if you look at my resources and what I have to do in terms of policy and delivering for my council district, it's tough to like put a lot of resources in putting on a huge event like this every year. But I certainly want to see it come back. How many of you were here this Saturday? Let's see. Okay. And let's take another vote. We're going to say how many, of course, I think I know what the results of this. How many want it back? Okay, how many don't want it back? Okay, so there you have it. I, I, I figured that would be the answer. But so certainly there's a lot of interest and people want to see it come back. I'm going to do whatever I can to bring it back, but we do have some challenges that we, some realistic challenges that we have to look at to bring back, uh, to, 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 to make it happen again. So those are just some of the questions we're going to ask ourselves in about a month. Uh, long winded answer, but I'm excited about Night on Broadway. It's, it's a great, it's becoming bigger than Broadway. It's a way of people just rediscovering uh, downtown. Uh, it's a way of re-identifying ourselves as a city. People come from all over and they just want to see who, what's the new demographics, who are these new Angelinos. It's like people feel good about feeling they're part of something. You know, that, and, and Dodgers had won the World Series, I would have did that too, but unfortunately that didn't happen. Um, but, you know, so that's, it, it, it serves a lot of purposes and we definitely don't want to lose this momentum. Um, and, and last but not least, it's people want to rediscover the historic that's basically what it comes down to. People love the history. People love these historic theaters. And uh, that's another angle. And so uh, all that to say is that the work you guys are doing is so important on a larger scale, not only for <coughs> everyday living here, but also for working here. Uh, 
but the visitors who come in and want to rediscover the historic course of corn. So that's why it's important that you guys keep doing the work you do and you know support whatever you do and uh, preserve the history here as well. So thank you. Good way to uh, present this 20-year anniversary resolution from the city uh, to uh, the mayor and congratulations to all of you. Congratulations. Mayor. Expect to see renewal packets later in the spring. 
we'll be in touch in advance of that to let you know more and to talk to each of you. And currently we're still going through the technical process. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to stay after and talk to any of you or answer your questions. Just to let you know, the mayor's office um, let us know yesterday afternoon they will not be present today to, to give their presentation, but they will be at a bid meeting in the future to unveil sort of their new strategy um, and talk a little bit about El Pueblo and, and some of the new ideas they have um, for structuring um, uh, forward thinking in addition to H and HHH, um, some other ideas that they've been proposing, um, El Pueblo being a pilot program in process right now. Uh, so I guess we can move on to the fun part of the meeting, which is the plaques. Um, we wanted to uh, thank our, all of our alternate members and our board members for their service. Um, and then the assembly member's office and the council office um, has provided some um, certificates for you as well. So we'd like to come up one at a time if we can and, and take a photo.
school. <laughs> the degree's not in there. There's no degree.